We're going to be talking about two things today. One, the vaccines, and two, were those virologists lying to us about the origin of this thing? Let's go take a look. Hello everyone, Dr. Chris Martinson here, and the uh, title of this one today, uh, yeah, I'm cautiously optimistic about this vaccine. Very new vaccine uh, types out there, mRNA vaccines. Obviously, we have zero to look at in history, so all new, could be exciting. Uh, the early results look okay, look good, but we don't have any date on that. So we'll get to that in just a second, but first let's turn to the email of the day. Here it is. Uh, this comes to us from Lisa. It says here, good day, Chris, or maybe good day. Good day, Chris. Could be. We don't know. Uh, but it sounds a little Australian. I want you to know how and why my husband, Joel, among your subscribers, thank you for that. Uh, thanks to all my subscribers who help support all the work I do here with Adam to bring content like this to the world. Thank you. Uh, and I are immensely grateful to you for your, your Herculean commitment to presenting good science. Yes, my tribe, with unassailable logic in the manner you do. Your COVID-19 presentations on peak prosperity have been an edifying way to spend time together, snuggling on the couch. Oh, I support that. That's, that sounds nice. We enjoy your podcast as much as many folks enjoy their favorite reality show. All right. I like that. Because, uh, uh, yeah, this is all about the, there are people who like to think this way, and, and that's our tribe. It, it's it's uh, exciting to engage your brain, and that's the subject of this email right here. Uh, Though pandemic uh, germane facts are tragic, infuriating, and frustrating, totally in agreement on that, we uh, we take pleasure in the articulate way you present them. Your impressive command of critical thinking skills, keen awareness of the science that informs these issues, willingness to engage others, e.g. virologists, oops, we're going (laughs) to have might disengage them today, we'll find out, and helpful adroitness with resources such as presentation platform references provide tremendous educational value. It's like a university-level course. We find your presentations extremely valuable to keeping us informed about COVID-19. Ergo, we can also educate others. Bingo. Thanks for doing that. Uh, It's important. They are of great value, too, for exercising our cognitive function. Super important as we are older folks. I'm glad you don't dumb down the information or explanations Yet your skill as an educator makes the topics accessible to anyone willing to use the brain. Kind regards, Lisa. Thank you, Lisa and Joel. Um, yeah, that's what this is all about. And, and I do agree with you that uh, keeping our brains flexible requires us to entertain lots of different thoughts and um, to, to critically evaluate things. It's, it's just as much a, a, a muscle to exercise as anything else out there, like, like a regular muscle we would think about. So thanks for that. And, and I chopped a little of this email off, Lisa went on to... Uh, to say, and, and we're a little worried that maybe you should maybe get your um, uh, levels of uh, cortisol checked. And yes, it's it's true that uh, this has all taken a bit of a toll. I, I, I've bit off a lot this year, um, moving to a new place, starting a farm, as it were, uh, uh, first uritis on a new property, lots of projects, um, uh, taking on a variety of things. And there's a fairly significant family health emergency in my immediate family, um, which has required a lot of attention too. So all in all, hey, <laughs> We call it 2020. And speaking of 2020, you know, there's this meme going on out there, which is uh, how it started, you know, and how it's going. Uh, I don't know if you've seen that one yet. If you haven't, it's pretty funny. You know, people will put like a um, like a picture of Jennifer Aniston for how it started and then say Alice Cooper for how it's going, you know, just like to show this huge degradation. So this is the this is the Christmas tree that they picked out for New York City, Rockefeller Center, big icon, uh, you know, get the holiday spirit going. And um, this is this is this is how it showed up when it got there. It's kind of, I mean, it's tragic, beautiful tree. But I don't know who was in charge of shipping it. But um, apparently, they didn't understand tree management 101. This just that's just so emblematic of 2020. And, and what can you do? You can just say, well, it kind of kind of looks like um, Charlie Brown's tree, right? I, that's what we can take. We can take the spirit of it. This is a Snoopy tree. <laughs> oh God, it's my new nickname. If you go to Times Square and you look at the trees, Snoopy. Maybe they can fix that up with a lot of decorations. Uh, we don't know. All right, Pfizer, Moderna, you've heard it. Uh, they, they've both reported 90 to 94.5% effectiveness in their mRNA vaccines. I, a lot of you have been asking for me to weigh in. I'd love to, but both of them have announced results via press release, and there's no data. So I have nothing to analyze and nothing to really look at at this point in time. So I all I can all I can do is give you my opinion of what I've read about them from their press releases. I don't think that's really helpful at this point. 
Um, I have a lot of questions remaining, of course. Uh, one, I haven't seen the data yet. Uh, two, we don't know how long these vaccines are going to last because there's more and more information coming out that people are getting secondary infections and we don't know how much the antibody response is important relative to the T cell response. We don't know how much these particular vaccines stimulate B cell and that is um, antibody responses versus uh, T cell uh, stimulation or dendritic cell or other things like that. So we, we don't know. A um, lot of questions about that. We don't know if there's going to be any evasion of the vaccine by the coronavirus, uh, by a mutation. Pretty normal thing for va- for viruses to do is, um, you know, the vaccine takes out most of them, but it leaves that tiny fragment of the population that had a critical mutation that it's not susceptible to the vaccine. And then those amplify. Next thing you know, you're on that treadmill in race. Coronaviruses seem to be less um, prone to those sorts of mutations than influenza, uh, but still a thing. We don't, it's an unknown at this point. And we don't have any long-term safety data. And by the way, as a reminder, we haven't done this mRNA, messenger RNA uh, vaccine before. So, so we don't know. We don't know. Um, and as good as the vaccines are, I got to just put, put this out there. 90% sounds really good. Um, ivermectin seems to have uh, really, really good results here, both prophylactically as well. So not saying you'd want to do that instead of a vaccine, but I will note that we have had things out there, including ivermectin and vitamin D3, that have been at least as good as the vaccines, and we've known about them since March, and they haven't been brought out and and really promoted by pretty much any government that I'm aware of in the so-called developed worlds. Um, Make of that what you will. And in my mind, there always should be, there's a a two-pronged fork Two tines in this fork. Uh, on the top, nutrition. Yeah, keep. if people are healthy, they will, of course, have a better uh, immune response. And you want to prepare the terrain. That means that you make sure people have critical levels of critical things in their minimum threshold levels. Vitamin D3 in the blood, selenium in the blood, zinc in the blood, serum levels, right? Those would be things that we would say, if you prepared the terrain like that and made sure that people were healthy and not on a, on a sick diet that, that was uh, basically working against them, that that would have as much of an impact as it, many, many, many lives would have been saved if that upper tine of that fork had been selected and promoted, which it really hasn't been at all. So for those of you, you know, I, I recently got some pushback from somebody saying, you know, how can you say the things, you know, how, how can you not think Fauci is one of the most amazing people ever? And I say, because, I'll tell you why, because he never promoted the top tine of this fork, ever, not once. Had to wait for him to get on an interview with Jennifer Garner for him to say that he personally takes vitamin D, but, you know, wouldn't recommend it for anybody else necessarily. Bizarre, because the data is really, really strong. And if we are a data-centric culture, and I think a lot of people were offended that the prior administration seemed to be a little anti-science in some ways, that offended them. Well, if you're pro-science, then you would be pro the top tine of this fork. And if you don't have that coming out, you should be asking, why not? Why do we not have that uh, here as, in, as well as many other countries? And then the bottom tine might be the vaccine, of course, and, and that's, a, that's a great thing, but it shouldn't be the be all end all. And by the way, by the way, the vaccine will only improve your odds of not catching COVID-19. The top tine of this fork will also prevent you from all sorts of other disease states. So there, it's not just that this is head to head, you know, should we prepare the terrain or do the vaccine? The top tine of this fork, if I was being fair and representing it, is a big, fat, giant tine that's way bigger than the one at the bottom because the top tine will help prevent all different kinds of disease outcomes and will improve odds for all different kinds of things. So they're not even equivalent in my mind. And so uh, the data is just startlingly clear on that at this point in time. All right. SARS-2 origin, kind of interesting, came out. A number of you sent this to me. Um, this is from a week ago now. Uh, well, no, f- I guess, what is it, 19, five days ago. Uh, this is an, uh, an editorial that comes out of the Washington Post. I was a little surprised to see it because for a while there, the official story across all the media was, this is natural. SARS-2 is a natural origin. Uh, but they write right here, they say, after so much death and illness, a mystery from the first days of the novel coronavirus is yet to be solved, we still don't understand its origins or how it became a global killer. The answers lie in China and quite possibly beyond. The world needs a credible, impartial investigation to better prepare for future pandemics. Couldn't agree more. 
Uh, most likely the virus was a zoonotic spillover. Oops, scratchy record noise. Uh, most likely, that's a qualifying um, term right there. There's no data one way or the other to support that it was a zoonotic spillover. I've, I've presented a lot of the data so far. Um, there is a bunch of data to suggest it came out of a lab. Um, but you could say there's no, there's no smoking gun either way, fine. But from a preponderance of evidence standpoint, uh, the weight clearly does not point to a, a natural event at this point in time. And that could change. I'm just telling you the data I have right now. I'll show you just a tiny piece of that flash to the past, a reminder from early this spring of 2020. They say uh, zoonotic spillover, a leap from animals to humans, which have become more common as people push into new areas where they have closer contact with wildlife. The facts are still extremely sparse. And then they go on to note that puzzlingly, we still don't know who patient zero was. And that's almost always the thing that you, you need to know more than anything is who is patient zero, the one that, that cha you can chase back. And if you can figure that out, you can find out where this came from. And then they spend all this time in the wet market, Wuhan. Please, three of the first four known Chinese cases had no contact with the wet market and they were the first cases. So the wet market got crossed out six months ago. Don't even talk about it anymore. It wasn't the source. The source was somewhere else. Plus we have that mysterious case of say the Algerian fishmonger in France who had the case back in November of last year, 2019, right? So a lot of things to su suggest that this story is anything but um, understood. Now, here's the fun part. When I first started talking about the data behind the idea that this could have come from a lab, I got a lot of pushback from virologists, uh, and many of them really took to me on Twitter, and uh, it was very, it was a co coordinated, coercive environment and they were being illogical and irrational and very much not open to debate. And I thought, um, I, I got, it felt like I was up against a club of mean girls at school. You know, they were just going to bully me into, into some sort of intellectual submission. They, they didn't get very far. But now, now, thanks to the U.S. Right to Know, uh, this organization, through a Freedom of Information Act, um, they obtained emails uh, that show a statement in The Lancet authored by 27 prominent public health scientists condemning conspiracy theories suggesting that COVID-19 does not have a natural origin. I was one of them. <laughs> one of those people. Was organized by employees of EcoHealth Alliance. Oh no, that's the nonprofit group that's received millions of dollars of U.S. taxpayer funding to genetically manipulate coronaviruses with scientists at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Whoops. Um, that was organized, that letter in the Lancet was organized by employees of EcoHealth Alliance. Of course, that's Peter Daszak's uh, thing. Uh, let's keep reading. I think they explained it better than I would right there. The emails obtained uh, via public records requests show that EcoHealth Alliance President Peter Daszak drafted the Lancet statement, and Peter is number one on my list of people who I'd most be interested to see talked to by investigators around this whole thing, and that he intended it to not be identifiable as coming from any one organization or person, meaning, hey, it's going to look pretty bad if it, sees, if it looks like I drafted it and my organization, which is like uh, the most culpable, the, the first organization you'd want to ask some hard questions about. Yeah, yeah, of course he didn't want it to, to be identifiable as coming from him or his organization. Of course. Uh, and, uh, um, but rather to be seen as a, simply a letter from leading scientists. Uh, you're talking to you right now, leading scientists. Yes, you and you and you. The ones we went back and forth and I kept going, this is odd. This is odd. Where did this come from? And just you shouted me down at the time saying, you're not qualified. This is why we hate debating people who don't know what they're talking about. You know, so you had the appeal to authority. There were the ad hominem attacks. When all else failed, there was always the... This is why we don't like debating conspiracy theorists. And all the time, I just kept saying things like, where did that polybasic PR or a furin cleavage site come from? Mm -hmm. Simple questions uh, that they had no answer for. The scientist letter appeared in the Lancet on February 18th. February 18th. Consider this. This thing broke across public consciousness late January. I, my first uh, output on it was January 23rd. By middle of February, they'd already coordinated and wrote and submitted and had approved a letter in the Lancet to quickly say that this wasn't of, of uh, anything but natural origin. Now, now, that's a little early, don't you think? Don't you think like 
how would how would you possibly be making the case then before any investigation had been conducted, before any teams had gotten into Wuhan properly, that before anybody had studied anything and already a letter from leading scientists. Uh, and by the way, shame on all you leading scientists who penned your name to this. That's not science. It's something else. And that's why I'm offended. I like science. I don't like other stuff that's uh, not science. Uh, and so that was just one week after the WHO announced the disease caused by the, the disease caused by would be named COVID nineteen. So just one week after the naming of COVID nineteen, you got Peter Daszak and his or and his organization getting a bunch of people to sign on and and basically say um, condemning conspiracy theories suggesting that COVID nineteen does not have a natural origin. Ooh, that stinks to high heaven. That just stinks. Um, you know what? Actually, I, I have a real-time translation. I, 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 I took this uh, statement and I ran it through Google Translate and I said, give me an image because uh, Google can do that now. It can translate this to, to German, to Korean, any language you want, but it can also translate to images and it came back with this. <laughs> All right, my kind of joking. But I, I handpicked this carefully myself. I can't figure out if it's just one giant steam and pile or two. Uh, I, I'm going to say it looks like two at this point in time. All right. Um, at any rate, uh, just to quickly recount this, uh, remember, so, so in that Washington Post op-ed, their, their editorial, they're basically saying, look, there's not a lot of data. Maybe it's a zoonotic spillover. We don't know. We, you know, we don't know. I'll tell you, I presented this a long time ago, um, and this was one of those leading scientists, Holmes, by the way, and I presented this date on May 12th, long enough ago to get the facts sort of marshaled and organized in this story, noting that when you're comparing the sequences of the receptor binding domain, the all-important receptor binding domain of SARS-CoV-2, highlighted in yellow here, against who does it have the most close match to? The pangolin. There is absolutely no identifiable mechanism where a bat would get in somehow contact with a pangolin because they have such different lifestyles and the pangolin's all like remote and alone and lives on the ground and, and the bats fly around and they live in different spots. And there was, there was no way you could imagine these two things coming together. And then somehow magically, just that piece from the pangolin, the receptor binding domain, which binds so beautifully to the human ACE2 receptor, and taking that one piece out, keeping all the rest back, and then also inserting this polybasic furin cleavage site, which I'll get to in just a second if you haven't been following along. That sounds like gobbledygook, but it's important. I'll get to it in just a second. This right here, when you look at this kind of data, very, the most important question you would be asking is, how did, how did that happen? How, how are you proposing that uh, a bat and a pangolin got together and then more magic happened uh, outside of a lab setting? Uh, honestly, it's, it's just, it's silly. Uh, and by the way, the most important question in this whole story is where did that polybasic furin cleavage site, PRRA, come from? What we're looking at here is all these different human SARS coves, uh, civet um, SARS, uh, raccoon, pangolin, bats, all these different bat ones down here, all the closest ones, including this one, ZXC21 and uh, the 42 and stuff like that. So, and by the way, this table goes on. I chopped it off so we could at least have a chance of seeing it. Um, and what you notice, this little mystery sequence is just tucked right in here, only on SARS-CoV-2. And that's the PRRA sequence. It provides a polybasic furin cleavage site. Furin is a protease with that cleavage, when that cleavage happens then this thing becomes potentiated and it, and it has a thousand times more effective at entering a human cell than if it didn't have that site. That's the exact site that virologists like Peter Daszak and other gain-of-function researchers insert specifically in the lab in order to make viruses more transfective, transmissive, infective, deadly, all that stuff. That's the gain of function they talk about. You're like, gain, gain sounds good. I like gaining functions. I hate losing functions. Gain of function sounds good. No, in virology, gain of function's awful. Gain of function means spreads faster, kills more. Those are the functions they're looking after uh, to increase so they can study them is the idea. I'm not sure how much of that happens versus military research, but who knows? At any rate, the point of this is when you scan across all these other SARS viruses, none of them have that little site. None of them. They don't have that. Uh, so that would that was like some of my earliest uh, information data that would say, you know, I think in the scheme of things, it was most likely that somebody put that there. That that's just that's the most likely explanation. I like most. I like I like simple. Most likely it's simple. I don't have to think. Uh, okay, so a bat got near a pangolin, 
And then the pangolin went and did something off, off the reservation with some other species to, to gain this thing from somewhere. Uh, we don't, it's just, that's just silly. Too, too much for me. All right. Hey, as we head into the holidays, though, I, I just need you to know that um, apparently this needs repeating. You got to watch the decorations, okay? You just got to, you want to watch that. This just came out, I saw this this morning, the Belgian mayor admitted to local residents that he did not mean to make this year's Christmas decorations appear quite so phallic. Uh, yeah, no, total accident. We, it, it could happen to anybody. Uh, in fact, in fact, if you really want to get serious about it, that's a mistake, but not nearly as much of a mistake as maybe wrapping Christmas lights around palm trees. <laughs> That's a, that's a very bad idea. I mean, at least if, unless this is a 55 and over community or something, no kids allowed. I don't know. Uh, but at any rate, just watch the decorations this year. And because uh, it's 2020, whatever can go wrong will not only go wrong, but really wrong. So um, at any rate, that's all I have for you today. And uh, we're going to be uh, uh, just alerting you to the idea that we may be switching up this program a little bit in terms of how many I want to do higher quality things. I have to start conserving my energy a little bit here as I uh, deal with other things. So just be on the lookout for that. Um, we're going to keep doing what we do and, um, I may have to have, find a little more work-life balance here for myself at some point. So that's all I got for today. Hey, have, uh, a really great weekend and we'll see you next time. Bye.